let's get started. Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for um, just silliness and the fun we get to have with making raps about Brayden. Um, thank you, God, for worship and just an opportunity to come before you and just prepare our hearts to listen and hear what it is that your spirit has for us. And I just ask that your words are what they hear. God, let me get out of your way and let your spirit do its work. In your name we pray. Amen. So we've been going through a series over the last couple of weeks. He's been in the book of Galatians. And we've been listening to some really interesting information that the Apostle Paul sent letters to the church in Galatia. And he gave them some feedback. But it wasn't just any old feedback. It was some spicy feedback. Okay? Like, for example, the week that Travis spoke, like, literally the opening line in Galatians 3 is like, you freaking idiots. Okay? So just so you know, what the church in Galatia is doing is they kind of strayed from what Paul originally told them, and they've kind of like gone off into a couple different like false gospels. They've started following some things that are really easy. If we don't know what the real gospel is, it's really easy to fall for what isn't the real gospel. And so I want to start out first things first, your first fill in the blank, the real gospel is not about what we can do to get to God. It's about what he did to get to us. The real gospel is not about what we can do to get to God. It's about what he can do or what he did to get to us. There is something so profound about understanding that it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with how I can earn it. It has nothing to do with if I do all of these things and check these boxes, then God's going to give me a happy and prosperous life. It has nothing to do with if I just love myself better, then the Lord will be able to work better through me. No, it has nothing to do with us. And it has everything to do with what God did to get to us. That is a humbling place to be in. We were not worth it. On our own, we were never in a million years going to be worth it. The God of the universe who created all things to come out down to this earth and put his life on the line for us? If you just sit in that for a moment and realize how incredibly unworthy we are as a single person for God to even see us on a planet full of billions of people, and yet the real gospel tells us everything in this Bible is about how God did everything he could to get to us. I love that. And then we go through the rest of Galatians, and it basically just teaches us, like, what comes from that? When we put our heart in that place and we surrender and we say, God, you did that. Now I am going to respond in this way. It tells us we get to be part of his family, fully adopted, fully immersed into his family. And then something that I absolutely love that Shara shared on her week and that I wrote in my Bible because I was like, goodness, Jesus, that was so good, is your next fill in the blank. It says, faith alone saves. But faith that saves is never alone. Faith alone saves. But faith that saves is never alone. And we're going to read today in Galatians 5. So if you want to start popping over there after you fill in alone and alone um, to Galatians 5. We're going to be reading in there and looking at what does it mean to have faith not be alone? If we've surrendered our life to Jesus, if we've given it over to him, then what does it mean for my faith to not be alone? All right. You can catch up. You can get to Galatians 5 if you haven't got there already. I'm going to start in verse 13. Galatians 5, verse 13. All right, it says, for you were called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. And right there, we're going to just stop there for a second. So first, I just want to get a type of false gospel out of the way, is that when we think, well, love your neighbor as yourself, and I have this freedom in Christ, Okay, he's released me from sin. Sin is not my master anymore. That means I'm going to take my flesh, which is a really gross word if you think about it, 
but my humanity and my sinful nature, okay? And I'm going to say, all right, Lord, now I'm going to step into the spirit side of myself because you are now the owner of me. You are the king of my spirit, okay? So if we're going to take that freedom, some of us still can live in this place where we're like, well, I was diagnosed with ADHD, so I'm just going to live there and I'm going to excuse all the things that I do because this is my diagnosis. Or I'm going to say, I grew up in a really loud family, so I'm just loud and obnoxious and I am not going to operate in a way that like quiets or calms down for other people. Or you could just be like, I just, I just like telling the truth so much that sometimes I'm really blunt and say mean things. And you just excuse these things because you're going, well, this is who I am. This is how the Lord made me to be. And that may be so, but that is a very human version of what we were made to be. And God is saying, I have made you. Yes, I built these things in you on purpose. I'm not going to waste them, but I also need you to surrender them. I also need you to be able to use them in a way that serves me, God, not serves you, human. And so that's where Paul is coming in here and saying, Galatians, like you've gotten so off course here because now you're using this freedom of who you are in Christ to just go, well, that's who I am. I'm just going to be mean. I'm just going to be malicious. But you have to go back to this one important statement, love your neighbor as yourself. You have to go back there. So now we're going to read on, okay? So that's like the platform from which he's starting. We're going to start in verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. This is kind of a long passage, so buckle up, girlfriends and boyfriends. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. Those are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, he's going to talk about all the things that we do or can fall into if we are in the flesh, in our humanness. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery. Okay, so far, super unrelatable, and I hope so for you guys, okay? But we're going to get there. Hatreds. What? I hate people. What? You guys don't hate people? Okay, tis the season. Be honest. Jeez. Um, strife, jealousy, uh, 10 out of 10, I've been jealous. Outbursts of anger, well, does anybody here have an annoying sibling? Okay, here we are, living in our humanity. Dissensions, <laughs> hold on, hold on. This isn't, a su this isn't a support group. I know it feels like it right now, it really does. All right, we're still jumping back in here in verse 20. So, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions. Ever heard of a clique? A clique? Okay, so have you ever been like a, around a group of people that are like, no, this is our squad. And now you're not in it. You don't meet the criteria to be part of our cool club. Okay? That is a faction. Stop it. I'll move on now. Envy. Envy. Drunkenness, nope, don't do that. Carousing, I honestly don't know what that word means. And anything similar, I'm warning you about these things as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, when we choose to allow the Lord to have that space, is love, joy, peace, patience, literally the opposite of outbursts of anger, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. There's literally no law ever against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Oh my gosh, those are two very contrasting lists. But I think we can agree that if we're just operating out of our own selves, it's really easy to follow under that first list because there's no accountability there. But when we choose to surrender 
And when we have a life that is spirit-led and spirit-filled, we are always going to have some sort of change. Always. Because this work of the spirit is for him to change us from the inside out. And so this second little group of words of description, okay, the fruit of the spirit is what he's promising to us. When people talk about promises of God, you don't have to literally say the word promise in the scripture for it to be a promise. He promises here that if we have surrendered our lives to God, if he is filling us, then he promises that we're going to have these fruit. Okay, but a couple things. One, confession. I hate fruit. Okay? I know. But guess what, guys? When you grow up and you're adult, an adult, you don't have to like fruit. You can do whatever you want. You might not live as long as other people who do like fruit, but you still have that opportunity. But two, something else to understand here is there was a lot of qualities that he listed there, but it only said one fruit. Right? Whoa. Was that a typo? Guys, no, it wasn't. Let me explain it to you like this. Let's say after church today, we're all going to head on over to In-N-Out. Okay? If I order a number two, okay, that is all-encompassing. I don't need to say, I would like a number two, which please includes a fry and a soda and two pieces of bread and a piece of meat and a cheese and a lettuce and a tomato and some onion and some sauce. And maybe can I add spread? And can, like, no. When I say a number two, they know what I'm talking about. In the same way, when he says the fruit of the Spirit, it's the whole thing. It's the whole package. This is what the Spirit is promising us. And it's not a tree that has a whole bunch of, like, singular fruits. Every fruit has all of these qualities. And so, you might be asking yourself, and I might be asking myself, why fruit? Why didn't you make it the cheeseburger of the Spirit? But... I can promise you there's some really good reasons, okay? So we're going to dive in here. Three things that we need to know about fruit that helps us understand what the fruit of the Spirit are about. The first thing, okay, the first thing that we need to understand is that if we are Spirit-led, if we have given our lives to Jesus and we are Spirit-filled, we will have fruit as evidence because fruit grows on, grows because the branch is connected to the tree. Fruit grows because a branch is connected to a tree. This seems super obvious. This is biology 101. But here's the thing. Fruit doesn't grow on its own. There's not just a magic orchard where fruit is floating in the air. Okay? It has to have a tree that is planted in soil. It has to be watered. It has to have sunlight. It has to be tended to. And we, as believers have the privilege of having God, the most perfect and righteous thing ever in the whole wide world, be what we are connected to, and that's what creates our fruit. I'm going to flip over real quick, and I'm going to read you a passage from John 15. If you want to jump over there, you're more than welcome to. John 15. This is a passage that the disciple John wrote, one of the disciples that was one of Jesus' besties, and so he's talking about, he describes this. He says, I am the vine, the true vine, talking about Jesus. Jesus is the true vine, and God is the gardener. Every branch in Jesus that does not produce fruit, God removes. And God prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. And then down in verse 4, it says, remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, Neither can you unless you remain in me. This is Jesus telling us very specifically that in order for us to create fruit, we have to be connected to the tree. We have to be seeking out where our power even comes from because it's not from ourselves. Okay, so maybe you guys aren't gardeners, but have you ever heard of a game called Super Mario Kart? Me too. Okay, so imagine this. Super Mario Kart, you have to play it on a console, okay? And that console has to have electricity, okay? So in the same way that a tree has to be planted into the ground in order to be, like, growing and fruitful, 
Our console needs to be plugged in. We need to have ourselves plugged into who God is. We need to show up, okay, and say, God, you're in charge. And then we start our game. And then before we even get on the racetrack, we get to pick out our accessories and, like, what character you're going to be. And I'll be Princess Peach, okay? And I'll have, like, some super sparkly little umbrella thingy so that when I fly in the air, it's magical, okay? Those accessories, those are, like, those special gifts that the Lord gives you that you alone are equipped with. And he says... Kate, you're going to crush it as Princess Peach out, Peach out there because I have granted you amazing spiritual gifts, okay? Then you get onto the track and you're like, ready, let's go. I'm just going to race with myself because, well, it works that way. So I start the game. I'm practicing. When we are playing that game, that's our game of life. Guys, we're like going down the track. We're crushing it. We're plugged into the source so the game can actually be played. I am okay with who I am because the Lord is the one who has chosen those accessories and those amazing characters for myself and the cool, like, really pumped up wheels. And then power-ups, right? Aren't power-ups freaking legit? You get to go super fast or you're, like, invisible or, like, you can fly. Yeah, there's, like, a million awesome power-ups. Those power-ups, those power-ups to me are things like church, like TNL, small groups camps, having people that are holding you accountable. Because the most important thing, you can't even get to those power-ups if you're not connected to Jesus, if you haven't handed over that steering wheel to your little go-kart, and then being able to go to church and being able to hear the word from different perspectives and being able to have friends that hold you accountable. Those are all those extra things that are super legit bonuses but you don't get any of those if you don't plug in to the console first. Does that make sense? Yes. I just thought that was like a really fun picture. Amen, sister. All right, so if we are spirit-led and we are spirit-filled and we all have fruit as evidence because the branch is connected to the tree, the next best thing that we have is that fruit is attractive. Fruit is attractive. You guys know that they like pick out all the really pretty fruits that you pick up at Sprouts and Fraser Farms and Albertsons, and then now they have super cool farm boxes that you can get of all the reject produce. You guys know that? You can get like really like morphed carrots because ain't no one buying that because they're ugly. Yeah, probably. That sounds like a perfect name. Yes, that's what I've seen. Okay, Maggie is tracking with me. So in that same way, if we are connected to the most healthy tree that there ever was because it is God and he is perfection, then we are going to be able to be connected to that, and then we're going to be able to create attractive fruit. But just like how there's ugly, gross, weird, um, deformed fruit, I think sometimes when we do the fruit of me and not the fruit of thee, that sometimes our fruit can look kind of yucky. I think some of you guys may have encountered at some point in your life people who say that they're believers, but they certainly don't act like it. And then they give us a bad name. If you've ever met someone who, dare you say, is a hypocrite, who says, these are all the things that we're supposed to be doing, but then they don't act out of that, they act the opposite. I think there's a lot of people that don't come to church because they've known so many of us like that. Because we are not attractive fruit. Because we're operating out of our own power, out of our own will, and out of our own flesh. We are not called to have unattractive fruit, but we are called to be filled with the Spirit. And if we are, and if we are continually going back to God that our fruit is naturally going to become attractive. If we give the spirit that space to grow these things, then he is going to be able to make that attractive fruit. And then, one, people will be attracted to you and maybe want to come up to you and say, hey, I noticed that you responded differently to that person. You showed gentleness and kindness instead of outbursts of anger, which I totally would have related to. Or, if they find out that you go to church, they won't be surprised. Oh, I didn't know you went to church. You certainly don't act like someone I think would know Jesus. Or you'll just earn the right to be heard if they ask you a question. 
sometimes our actions don't speak before us in a good way. And then when someone finds out we know Jesus, they don't want to have anything to do with us. Because it doesn't line up, because our fruit isn't attractive. But if it is, imagine the impact that we can have. Fruit is attractive. And finally, fruit takes time. Fruit takes time. This is something that I really want to give you all permission with. I think sometimes it can sound really overwhelming to have all of these traits just like magically born out of us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's a lot. That's like a big mantle to have to wear. But fruit doesn't just appear. It doesn't just magically show up on a tree. Did you know that an apple tree, from seed to bearing one fruit, one to two years, which is actually pretty fast for a fruit tree, okay? One to two years for an apple tree. Orange tree, three to five years. For one fruit, for just fruit to grow strong enough, to have dug its roots deep enough, for it to be nourished enough to not just grow leaves, but to grow fruit. Three to five years. Avocado tree. Avocado lovers in here? See, if you live in SoCal, you know the beauty of avocados. Okay, avocados... Five to 12 years. Okay, so if you want to have an avocado tree growing in your backyard, you better hurry up and plant that seed because you're going to maybe have a sandwich in 12 years. Okay, so what the Lord is teaching us here in this passage, specifically calling these the fruit of the Spirit, is that it takes time. Lower the bar for yourself. It's not going to be instant. It's more likely that simply as we show up, and by show up, I mean we specifically and intentionally spend time on our own with God. And then when we have those moments where I decide specifically for myself, I need to take a hot second before I just blurt out anything that's in my head. That's me giving space for the Spirit to put one of His fruit. He's giving me the self-control to be able to say, oh, pump the brakes, girlfriend. I have something to do here. I brought this plant because I'm in no way a horticulturalist, but I am super relevant because I have a pathos in my house. So because I brought this here, it's so far staying pretty much alive. Just like um, in the John 15 passage, there are pieces like that I have to take off. There are some dead leaves here that if I don't take them off, they're just going to waste energy for this plant to grow. And somebody might walk into my house and might go, whoa, look, you're keeping this pathos alive. And be like, yeah, toss, toss, I know I'm doing so good. But I also like to propagate them. I figured out how to do that. Propagating means I can like break off one of these stems and then I can grow more plants out of it. It's pretty neato. I can see little roots growing on some of them already. But if I do that, a really interesting thing happens. Each one of these leaves on this plant and on any other stem that I pull off and propagate, it takes a full week for one of these leaves to grow. A full week. That doesn't count the leaves that I have to prune off. That doesn't count the leaves that for some reason have a buggy through them and so they don't even thrive at all. But if you look at this whole plant and you set yourself up to that bar and say, I'm going to have all of these fruits instantly, I gave my life to Jesus, so how come I'm not being more kind? How come I'm not being more loving? How come I don't have joy all the dang time? Lower that bar. The real gospel isn't about what you can do to earn God. It's about what he's doing for you. Give him the time to make all of these leaves. Give him the time to share that fruit with you. So the final question that I have for you guys, it's just an introspective thought for yourselves. I just want you to ask, what can I do today to start growing better fruit? Like for me, does it mean like you need to set an alarm to wake up and spend time with Jesus on purpose without your phone? Does it mean you just pause for a hot second? 
and give the spirit the opportunity to say, mm, maybe you don't need to say that. Or bonus, maybe I'm going to give you something kind to say and encouraging. Maybe he's going to give you that opportunity to have self-control and to sit still and to focus and to listen to what someone's going through. Those are fruit. But give him the place to do that. Give him the space to show up. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for um, who you are. Thank you that you are the most magnificent gardener. And thank you for this promise. God, Lord knows that I can botch so much of your goodness when I'm operating out of my own self. Help me help these students to get out of the way. You do your thing, God, and let us simply be here for it. Let us be able to see your fruit. In your name we pray, amen.